All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back for the second week of our webinar series to help prepare you for the CHFP exam. I am Brad Adams. I am the website chair for the Tennessee chapter of HFMA. Um, and so a couple of quick housekeeping items this morning before we get going. Um, got a few questions in last week about availability of the recordings and any additional um, handouts or, or information that Christoph had. Um, so we have got that all posted now and taken care of. It's up on the Tennessee Chapters website. Um, and if you look in the in the chat section on your screen there, you should see the link to it. Um, it is tnhfma.org slash chfp hyphen webinars. Um, and, and there, that's the same page you went to to register. And so from there, you can get to the handouts as well as get to the videos over on YouTube. Um, so as we go through today, you know, questions, always make sure if you've got any questions that you put them in the, uh, the question box as well um, as raising your hand if you've got, a, got something that you, you want us to address on here. We are happy to do that. Um, but like I said, questions is the fastest way for us to kind of see things come through and know what's going on, especially if you're having um, any kind of problems. Um, with your connection or anything like that, that's where we can get to and see that. Um, today, um, our moderator is going to be Martha Kelfi. Um, I've known Martha since pretty much the start of my involvement in HFMA. She is the current VP for the Tennessee chapter and incoming president-elect. And so you'll be hearing her voice uh, today throughout this as well. And so, uh, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Christoph. Brad, thank you very much. And Martha, thank you. Uh, both of you ha are uh, the engines behind these uh, webinars. Uh, Brad, you, insofar as you uh, masterfully uh, pro uh, work the technology in the foreground and background, and Martha, you are the the motor behind these entire webinars and and drawing so many chapters and so many HFMA members into into these classes. Uh, you're the one who went to Federal Express uh, and uh, ordered 170 books and many of them you sent out yourself and, and, and you made sure that the registration worked, that the advertising worked. So Martha, a big, big thank you from uh, me on behalf of everyone who is uh, participating in these amazing webinars. I uh, listen to the, uh, the feedback I get and I got some wonderful feedback this last week on a number of things and I want to share that with you. First of all, um, one person uh, noticed that I had uh, misspelled my own email address in the welcome letter, so I put it on the first slide here. So if uh, I, I encourage you to get in touch with me if you have any questions uh, relating to this material. So thank you to uh, Rick Weeks for, for that pointer, and Rick also uh, found uh, something else that I want to quickly show you, and that is um, uh, uh, a solution to um, that where I had a mistake in my solution. Let me show you where that is. Okay. Uh, if you have worked all of the uh, ratios uh, in the in the case study, you like Rick will have noticed that there is the there was is it well, was a discrepancy between what I, uh, oh, where is this now? Ah, here we go, sorry. Uh, uh, th there's two sets of answers to the ratio, the study case in your book. One looks like this, and the first page of it uh, looks like this. In other words, I, I answered them all outside of a spreadsheet, just uh, listing them all. And uh, what Rick had noticed is that there was a discrepancy between 
what I said the answer was to ratio number 17, the fixed assets financing. Here it is correct. And then in the spreadsheets, and uh, these are the ones that I sent out after the fact, they're also in the book, but um, these would be, I think, posted on the website or maybe the, the blank web, web uh, uh, spreadsheet is. Here I had used wrong numbers. What I had done here, and I didn't correct it here, is I put all uh, long-term liabilities into the numerator and not just uh, long-term debt. And uh, while the numerators here in these sh uh, short formulas on the left are the same, if you look at the uh, description of the ratios, I explain that there actually is a difference here. And why is that? I can't tell you. It's just a, it's a flaw with how the ratios are state, stated in the online study guide, and maybe I should just move away from uh, using that as a, a authoritative reference and, and, and change it here myself. In any case, I made myself made a mistake here and uh, should have just used uh, uh, long-term debt here and not uh, uh, long-term liability. So be that as it may, these answers here are wrong and thank you, Rick, for finding them. Now, while we're at it and while I am explaining to you other changes that I have made, I want to point out one other thing to you. Um, there is, and this is a question I also had. Here we go. On page 35, the bottom in the, in the uh, exercise uh, there, I, you find this formula on the bottom of page 35. This is a ratio that uh, shows up in the online study guide and doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, maybe again, out of deference, I had put it into my study guide and uh, ended up taking it out of the section here, this section recently. It was in here with a big X through it. Uh, just to say, ignore this ratio, it doesn't make any sense. I'd forgotten to also take it out here in the exercise. So this is now gone in your book. So please may draw a big X on page 35 through that uh, highlighted uh, ratio. I, I'm not going to explain to you why I think it doesn't work, but just take my word for it that it's it's not a recognized ratio and it it it, it, it does not and it, it, it does not provide any meaningful information. The other thing I've done is uh, I went back to the, uh, I, I received yesterday the March HFMA magazine, maybe it's in your inbox also, and uh, I noticed up front that HFMA mentions uh, that they've now published the racial medians for 2013. So yesterday I went on to the HFMA website and added them here on the bottom. And if you can look at these yourself, look them up on the web uh, site, the HFMA website, or you can just do a screenshot, uh, a screen print of the, what you're looking at right now and insert it into your book. So these are the most current ratios as uh, published in HFMA. So with that said, I think we're ready to launch into the topic for today budgeting and forecasting. This is a large topic. It's well described in the study guide. If indeed you have the study guide and uh, are looking at it, if not, you are fine without it, uh, is my, my opinion on this. In any case, the online study guide um, breaks up uh, the topics we're covering today into two places. And I'm showing you the screens here and, and what, where the topics are. Variance analysis and break-even analysis show up in the financial reporting topic. Uh, the capital budgeting piece that we're also talking about today shows up in budgeting and forecasting. So we're combining those two sections and moving them together. So what are, so I just basically mentioned what the topics are that we are covering. And these are the, these are also quantitative topics and that's why we're paying attention to them here in these webinars. Variance analysis, cost, volume, profit, that's also called break-even analysis, and then capital budgeting. So those are the three quantitative topics that we're covering today. We're going to quickly take a, 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 
a side trip into cash budgeting. And what we're doing here is, um, I, I'm going to step back for a second. Essentially, when you budget, you're doing different things. You're starting generally with a strategic plan that might be three to five years out. And you are updating that just like uh, HFMA does with its strategic plan. Every chapter does the same. And then you convert uh, your strategic goals into uh, an operating budget. What is what are operations going to look like in the in the coming year? Then you generally prepare a capital budget, and we're getting to that later today. And then, lastly, you have to determine how much cash you need to finance uh, uh, yourself. Generally, the thing that's you, that is most concerning here is how to finance your capital budget. So a cash budget is important too. So the study guide uh, uh, does not talk about this topic at all, but it shows up on the exam and that's why we're covering it here. The secret to understanding how cash budgeting works for purpose of ex uh, answering questions on the exam is that you have to distinguish between uses of cash and sources of cash. And this is perhaps backwards from the way you might think about it. If you start with 10 million in the bank, you want to end the year with more than that in the bank, say 15 million, as you need to use cash to park it in your bank account. It's a use of cash. It's not a source of cash. It's a use. Conversely, if you withdraw money from your bank account, uh, you uh, acquire a source of cash in the process. And the, below are some very simple calculations, operating cash flow, asset sales, uh, add to your cash flow, asset acquisitions, uh, subtract from it, use of cash, here's the use of cash that I'm uh, parking, where I'm parking the 5 million in my bank, that's a use of cash. So I still need 12 million in cash and that I would have to f find a source of financing for. You see how it works on the other side if I am uh, using cash and uh, I, uh, watch my words carefully. I'm using cash from my bank balance, but it is a source of cash for my operations. Uh, there is a, uh, a longer example of how this works in the study guide. I'm going to go there right now. Here we go. I'm on page 42 in the book. This is this more res uh, closely resembles uh, what you might see on the exam. You're given a set of uh, financial information about an organization and you are to determine how much cash is needed uh, uh, to finance operations for the next year. Notice I have done two things here. This, is, this differs from your book. It says on this particular page uh, in the in the yellow highlight uh, cash flow from operations. Uh, change that please to income from operations. Just make a change in your book on this page 42 and change that to income from operations. Uh, and then this line down here with interest payments, I have I'm taking this out because I don't think it adds anything. You see it's zero, you're not adding or subtracting any cash there. But I think uh, cash flow from operations here is, uh, isn't is quite the right word. And if you look at the description here on the right, it's really uh, income from operations rather than cash flow. Because notice this is a non-cash item and I am adding it to cash flow from operations. So this can't be right. This has to say income from operations up here. So you see, I constantly uh, find ways to improve this text and, and make it uh, easier to, to learn from. Back to the forms of budgeting. Um, we're going to go away from budgeting right now and uh, go into a quantitative topic returning to budgeting at the last of our three quantitative topics for today when we talk about capital budgeting. So in the meantime, we're going to talk about first about variance analysis. And uh, let's take a look at, at this slide here. If you do variance analysis the way many people do, 
um, and you are, say, picture yourself as a department manager or a director, you receive in your inbox a report that shows you what your variances are between actual and budget, and, and you're invited to comment on those variances. What uh, many people do, and I have caught myself among them, is I, uh, uh, I is they, they make, uh, they go back in their memory bank and come up with the best answer they can to why budget was missed on a particular uh, expense line item, say. And uh, they, they can say, well, we weren't as busy, or there was this, or there was that. Uh, that's a, 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 not a, a rigorous way to do variance analysis. The better way to do it is to do a three-way variance analysis, where you uh, disaggregate a variance, a, a complete variance, a total variance in its three components. That's what we're talking about today. And what is good about this is that it uh, is objective and rigorous, it fosters accountability, and it relates inputs to outputs. So that's what the three-way variance analysis is. So what are the three ways? One is you're looking at input costs, at labor or supply costs. The second uh, way to disaggregate a variance is to uh, determine the effect of efficiency or, or productivity on your variance. And thirdly, the effect of volume. Now, most budgeting software systems take the, uh, the third element uh, out for you. They uh, flex with volume and thus don't require you to have to calculate or, or explain a volume variance. That's not how HFMA wants you to do it. They want you to show that you understand all three. So how does this work? Well, you see there's a bunch of formulas here. I don't find this particularly uh, helpful to look at it this way. It's a better approach, I think, to look at an example and uh, um, tackle the, this topic of variances this way. So right now I am on page 44 in your book. So this is a page that I urge you to bookmark and photocopy. It's just like the pages that start on page 24 and to, to 29 that we talked about last week. This is one of those key pages in the study guide here in this material. So what are we looking at on this particular page? I'm going to make it a little bit smaller here. This is the first page, 44, is labor variances. The second page looks a lot alike, uh, looks at the variances on supply costs. Since we know from last week that labor costs account for bulk of healthcare costs, about 60 to 70 percent, we are going to focus on the labor side of variances today. Let's see what all is uh, included here on this page. So on the left here on this labor variances uh, slide on page 44 in your book is a monthly responsibility report for our uh, uh, HFMA community hospital. So what are we looking at here? We have uh, an actual column, a budget column, a variance column, a percentage column, and a, another column with no label where you see either a U or an F. U is unfavorable, F is favorable. Below this first section, which lists wage expenses, are the labor hours associated with the wage expenses. Below that, we have medical supplies. We're going to ignore those because we're handling those on the next page uh, on the supply cost variance page. Then we have an all-important feature, and that is units of service. Uh, you cannot do variance analysis without a non-financial uh, measure such as units of service. You can't do it. it, it uh, you, you can only admire a dollar difference between our actual and budget, but you cannot analyze it uh, more deeply into what's going on. So you need units of service. You always do for variance analysis. And you will see that on the exam that uh, units of service will be given in the problem set. And if in the answer section under the four multiple choice answers under a variance question, you see 
uh, three multiple choice answers with dollar signs and one without a dollar sign, you'll know the one without the dollar sign never can be the right answer. Variances are always expressed in dollars, but they require something non-financial as a unit of service. So that's the distinction between the two. Then we have labor costs per hour. Those are calculated values from the data above. And then we have supply costs, which we're going to ignore for uh, the labor variance calculation. So let's look line by line what uh, is going on in this department. First of all, under units of service, notice that we're busier. We were busier than we thought we would. We produced 1,650 procedures. We budgeted for 1,500. Back up here to the wage expense, the department manager seems to be a fixed cost. How do I know that? The department manager worked 170 hours a month. There's no variance there that tells me this is an exempt employee. Uh, work works regardless of how busy the department is. So that's a fixed cost. Notice that the aides down here below, there seem to be two of them because there's 340 hours or twice 170. So there seem to be two aides working in the department and they seem to be a fixed cost as well. The, where are the variable costs? They are in this uh, technician two and in technician one. Uh, there's variances here. That's a, a, a sign that these are variable costs. They flex with uh, uh, how much work there is. And we have a, an unfavorable variance for both technician two and technician one. We see that also down here in the labor hours. Technician two, or there's several of them, worked 680 hours, 170 more than anticipated. And technician ones, however many they are, they work some overtime as well. So we that, that much we can tell just by looking at the information here on this report. Then also, these calculated values tell us, uh, give us more information. First of all, they tell us that our labor cost per hour uh, decreased. That's kind of nice. Uh, that, so that's a favorable variance. And then below that, our labor hours per unit of service went the other way. They increased. That's not necessarily a good sign. It means that it costs us more time and more money to do a single procedure. We budgeted 1.2 hours for one of these procedures. It actually took us 1.4. So that's an unfavorable variance. So armed with this knowledge now, let's calculate the three variances at right, starting with the easiest of the three, the price or the rate variance. And what is it? it? It's something that you see it here in the text. It measures the effect of the labor rate per hour on the department's performance. Favorable means the labor rate was less than budgeted. Unfavorable means the opposite. So in doing this calculation, notice that uh, I uh, bolded and underlined and changed the color of the first couple words. I prefer to start with actual and subtract budgeted from it. You can do it the other way around, starting with budgeted and, and uh, subtracting actual. It's your choice uh, which way you do it. Um, the thing to watch is uh, whether a negative number is good or bad. Here, by starting with actual $15 an hour, subtracting budgeted at $15.80, I, I, I have a negative 80 cents, but as we already saw before, that's a favorable variance. So F doesn't always mean the number is a plus number, and U doesn't mean it's a minus number. So actual labor rate per hour minus budgeted labor rate per hour, a rate variance of 80 cents per hour favorable, multiplied by the actual labor hours that we worked over here is where we get that number gives us a favorable variance of minus $1,848. So we have thus explained a third of the unfavorable variance over here. In, uh, explained it, yes, but it goes the other direction. It goes, uh, it goes uh, favorable rather than and this one is unfavorable. So the other two variances are going to have to do a lot of explaining, and they, they're probably both going to be unfavorable in order for us to get to an overall unfavorable variance. And that's the number here on the left that we're trying to explain. It's the $6,210 
in this particular month. That is uh, the first of the variances, the price or rate variance. That's easy. Let's look the, uh, at the next one, the efficiency variance. What does it do? It tells us what the impact of our productivity or efficiency is on the dollars and cents for the month. So favorable means that uh, we were more efficient than budgeted. Unfavorable means the opposite. Again, starting with uh, actual and subtracting budgeted, you see I, those numbers again are especially uh, called out to you. So we're clear about the order in which we're doing things. We find our actual hours to produce actual units of service, 2310. We already saw that once before. Here they are. I subtract from that, this gets a little tricky here, the budgeted labor hours to produce actual units of service. So what uh, should it have taken us to produce the actual units of service? Now notice that over here, uh, the, the number we use is 1,980. Now look on the left here. You don't see that 1,980 anywhere in this report on the left. So it, it's got to be a calculated number somehow. And the trick, and that's why we're spending time on this today, is to know which two numbers you multiply to calculate this 1980 hours. Normally I would stop here and um, uh, ask the audience to answer that. And maybe I will do that and see if there's someone out there who wants to answer to this in the chat. Well, I'll keep us moving here. The answer is uh, I, I take my actual units of service, my actual procedures right here, and I multiply it by the budgeted labor hours, this number right here, 1.2 hours. That's how much it should have taken us to uh, produce these uh, per, uh, per procedure, to produce our procedures. It took us, as I said earlier, 1.4 hours instead. So 1650 times 1 1.2 gets you this number, 1980. So that's that's a, that's something you're going to have to memorize and learn and under, better yet understand so you can do this uh, on the exam and you can also do it, I, I submit, when you are analyzing productivity in your own department. This is a, a wonderful tool if you know how uh, how to do it. So that's how you calculate the efficiency variance. We have gone one more to go, the volume variance, and then we're home free. The volume variance, as I said earlier, measures the effect of uh, how busy we are on our numbers. The result of the, uh, the volume variance will always be negative if I am busier than anticipated doesn't sound like it should be negative, but my costs are going to be higher if I'm busier than I budgeted to be. So, so busyness translates in this case into a, an unfavorable variance. So if I look at how busy we were, we were 150 procedures busier than we planned to be. So we can expect the volume variance to be unfavorable. The calculation for the volume variance is shown here below and again I highlighted and bolded and changed the color and underlined the uh, uh, order in which I use the numbers. I'm taking the budgeted labor hours to produce uh, emphasis actual units of service and I subtract from that the budgeted labor hours to produce budgeted units of service. So again I'm using the actual minus budgeted uh, convention here. Uh, the numbers are familiar. The uh, first one, 1980, which is the budgeted labor hours to produce actual units of service. We've already calculated above here in the efficiency variance by multiplying our budgeted efficiency by our actual numbers of uh, uh, units uh, produced. And we subtract from it simply the budgeted labor hours to produce budgeted units of service, this number up here, 1800. If I do the math right, I multiply by the budgeted labor rate, I get my unfavorable variance here of 2,800 and 
144. Now, you may want to ask, why am I multiplying in both cases, in the efficiency variance and the volume variance, why am I multiplying by the budgeted labor rate here, 1580, and also down here, 1580, and not by the actual labor rate? Well, the answer is I've already uh, handled or dealt with uh, the actual labor cost uh, compared to budgeted in the rate or variant or uh, price variance up above. So I don't want to do that again down here. So I'm using the budgeted labor rate in both of these calculations. So I know I've done a lot of fast talking and I hope I've talked loud enough uh, so that you could hear me uh, go through this uh, uh, tour de force calculation very quickly. That's how this stuff works. On the non-labor side, it works exactly the same, and uh, the variance we're trying to explain here is $762 unfavorable, and you see if I add up my three variances on the supply side, I also come up with the same answer. So you can always check your your math by making sure that the three variances uh, add up to the variance on the report. So with that said, I think we should do some, um, are we ready to do some case studies? Well, we normally would do a, a large case study here. We're not ready for the polling questions yet, Martha. The polling questions uh, we're going to go to a little bit later. But let me show you what uh, the case study here is. Uh, boy. I don't remember the page number. I'm going to have to go find it myself. Um, and you are invited to work on this case study on your own. I will just uh, explain it to you and then move on. The case study starts on page 268. I'm going to go there myself here. Here we go. All right, so what we're doing here, we pretend that you are, uh, you work for finance in your facility and uh, you are the liaison to all of the, uh, some of the departments, some of the many, many cost centers in your facility. You happen to be assigned to the business office, the patient accounts department, and uh, you're on a mission to explain to the new patient accounts manager how to analyze variances and then uh, uh, report on the reasons for the variances. So your job is to make sure the manager understands how to do it and you're, you've got the April uh, uh, financial statements here, or operate uh, um, uh, department budget, departmental operating summary spreadsheet. And here's the report. This is the report you uh, are carrying along with you. This is also the report the PFS manager got in, in his or her inbox. Uh, the number here to explain, let's first of all see what we're talking about. This is abridged, so we're not looking at everything. It's for 10 months, say this is for April. Actual budget, the variance, the variance percentage, even what it was last year and then what the variance from last year is as well. So that's what we're looking at. There's also going to be just a, a, a monthly side to this report. We're looking at the year-to-date portion of it here. So here are all my costs, cost, 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 total labor cost of 575000 and some dollars. Then notice that the next item, and this is why this thing is abridged, has my non-labor costs here. There's a lot of detail, all many, many line items of non-labor costs here. For purposes of this exercise, I took those out, figuring that uh, we're looking at enough numbers here already, not make it any more confusing. We're only doing the labor side of the variances here. Then down below, I've got my non-financial number here. This is the stuff without the dollar sign. This is my revenue stats. And remember, we looked at different, different uh, measures of utilization last week 
in our discussion on uh, financial ratios, you know, patient days or admissions or adjusted patient days, adjusted admissions. I don't know what this uh, uh, particular statistic here is. We're just going to have to take it on faith that it's a, a valid one and it would be one that gets uh, agreed upon uh, during budgeting. You know, what are we going to use for this department? What makes sense to use as a labor statistic, as a volume statistic here? So that's what's on this first page. And uh, if you follow me on to the next page here, we have our hour section, similar to the uh, abbreviated hour section we had in our earlier example. Uh, and then we have uh, FTEs, and then we have some other calculated values here, including labor rate per hour. You're familiar with this also from the earlier example. And then we have labor hours per unit of service. These are calculated values. Uh, you can calculate them yourself on the exam. You're probably going to be given them. Uh, the reason I highlighted various numbers here is to make it easier to do the case study. These are the highlighted yellow numbers are the ones you need to do the variance analysis. So what is the number we're trying to explain overall? It's this one right here. It's the variance amount for labor costs. It's 29,132. That's the number that begs to be explained for labor variances. That's my variance year to date for uh, patient financial services cost center. Uh, how this math works and which numbers you multiply with which, I leave to you. Uh, you can always look at the answer in the back of the book. But I have here a, a little spreadsheet into which you um, put the numbers. And then on the right, uh, you can put the uh, explanation, you interpret what the numbers are saying. And so as, as the liaison to the PFS department, you would help the manager do the calculation and maybe even bring a spreadsheet like this along and say, oh, let's load this up in Excel and let's do the math here. So the uh, sp uh, spreadsheet here on the left tells you exactly what you need to do uh, the exam won't give you that information. You're going to have to use your trusty calculator to do all of this uh, from memory. But here on this, for this purpose of this exercise, I'm telling you here on the left what it is you need. And in cases where you need to do a calculation where a certain number has to be calculated first, such as we're doing here with budgeted labor hours to produce actual units of service, I give you the space here to enter, enter the numbers and do the calculation. And if you do this right, you are going to explain the variances more or less in total. And uh, on 360 is the answer. Here we go. So you can take a look at this. You can see in this particular case for this uh, PFS department, we had a, a considerably more expensive workforce. The actual cost of labor per hour, and this is out to four decimal points, was $18 and some cents, a whole dollar more than what we budgeted. So we have a very large uh, uh, rate variance. Then on the efficiency variance, we were uh, very, very efficient. So we have a favorable variance that is actually twice as much as the the variance on the rate or labor cost. So that goes the other direction. And then down below, since we were busier than we anticipated, we have a very large unfavorable variance on our volume. So, and then here on the right, you can take a look at this yourself, are uh, the explanations that uh, you and the uh, PFS manager came up with together. So that's how this works, and that's all we have time for to talk about. This is tested. This topic is tested uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, given surprisingly a lot of weight on the exam. That's why variance, that's why we're spending so much time on this. If you are a CPA or you have studied uh, management accounting, 
you will be familiar with with variance analysis and these calculations and and will know that in the manufacturing world there's actually more complicated ways to do variances that we don't even have to get involved in here uh, we are now going to go to the next topic and we're not ready yet for the polling questions because we need to cover this next topic first before we get to our first polling question so here is um, the next topic we need to talk about which is cost volume profit and uh, this this diagram that I have up on the screen right now is also on page 47 in your book so let me explain what we're doing here and uh, hopefully you will find this diagram useful in understanding this topic so what is cost volume profit or break-even analysis in the first place it's a it's a mathematical tool that looks at the relationship of cost to volume to profit uh, to see you know uh, um, how profitable are we in relation to how busy we are and what our cost structure is and uh, more specifically we are interested in knowing at what point we start making money in something this sounds very abstract and it sounds like it can't possibly have anything to do with healthcare but we'll come to that in a moment so bear with me as I explain this diagram to you at uh, first so we have a bunch of abbreviations here we have fixed cost this is FC variable cost which is which is denoted here as VC and then we have something called a CM which stands for contribution margin you will remember from our variance analysis that we've already encountered an example of variable and fixed cost by finding that the department manager and the two aides in that uh, first uh, variance analysis example were examples of uh, fixed costs and the technicians two and one were examples of variable cost this diagram here shows you the relationship of these various kinds of costs so we have a Cartesian coordinate system here with an x-axis a y-axis units of service going from zero and increasing to the right on the x-axis and dollars of costs or revenue or profit or whatever going on the y-axis from from zero uh, increasing as you go up that y coordinate now looking at the various lines in this uh, coordinate system fixed costs are level the, uh, they are in uh, occurred incurred regardless of how busy you are so you're paying the manager and the two aides whether you are doing anything producing anything or not so we denote that as a flat horizontal line here it starts at some level of dollars of cost and stays the same then we have another line for variable cost this red line right here that's the in the earlier example the labor costs for uh, technicians two and one and there would be other things in there as well but we're there assumed to be linear so the busier we are the greater those costs are going to be and we're going to assume that those costs actually start at zero which they may not in fact do in real life but uh, we're working with a simplified model here our revenue line our charges so to speak or net charges as as they would be in healthcare you're not not going to want to use growth gross dollars here it's going to hopefully be a steeper line it's this uh, thicker red line over here it better be steeper than my variable costs otherwise I uh, I'm losing money on every unit I make and uh, digging myself deeper and deeper into a hole so revenue better be a steep line if I add my fixed costs and my variable costs together I get this uh, thinner black line here which is parallel to the variable cost line uh, at some point that line which is my total cost is going to intersect my revenue and at that point I'm going to exactly break even I will not have neither lost money nor made a profit yet so what is characteristic about this point where my mouse is hovering right now at that point this red line which is the difference between revenue and variable cost at this particular point is exactly as high as this line down here my fixed cost so at uh, break even there is something 
uh, interesting, uh, there's an interesting relationship here, and that is that contribution margin equals fixed cost. Now, we still don't know what contribution margin is. We, we haven't explained it. Contribution margin is nothing other than revenue minus variable cost. So memorize that contribution margin is revenue minus variable cost. Okay. In other words, it's the margin that, so to speak, contributes to covering my fixed costs. And insofar as I go farther to the right and my contribution margin increases, uh, I uh, am making a profit because I'm covering more than my fixed cost. Below that level, my red contribution margin line is going to be less tall. It's going to be smaller than my fixed cost line. So the, these relationships shown here on this graph, on this graphic, are key to understanding this topic. So definition number one you have to memorize is contribution margin equals revenue minus variable cost, period. That's just the definition of a contribution margin. Secondly, the thing to remember that at break even, as I mentioned, contribution margin equals fixed cost. And third thing to memorize is that at break even, if I want to know at what point I reach break even, uh, uh, I determine what that point is by taking my total fixed costs and dividing them by contribution margin per unit. Uh, how does that work? We see that here at right. Fixed cost, this horizontal line, $20,000, doesn't vary. My revenue, $2 per unit. My variable costs, 40 cents per unit. Um, that gives me a contribution margin of $1.60 per unit, a, a very handsome rate, uh, uh, rate of profitability. And my break-even using this uh, uh, third definition down here of break-even as fixed cost divided by contribution margin per unit is thus $20,000, my fixed cost divided by my contribution margin per unit or $1.60 per unit. I do the math, I come up with a break-even point of 12,500. So that's where this arrow is. That's where this would be at 12,500 widgets. So whatever it is, we're measuring uh, the cost volume profit relationship for. So I want to, before we go to Martha's polling questions, very, very quickly take you back to page 46 in the book where all of this is explained in so many words. Just go over it again since you've just been staring at the diagram for all this while. Let's look at the text here. So contribution margin, the definition of it is revenue minus variable cost. So I take variable costs away from revenue, I get contribution margin. I subtract fixed costs, I get profit. The example we just dealt with is uh, described here again. You see this all again. You see the calculation here as well. The formula for break even is fixed cost divided by revenue per unit minus variable cost per unit, or as we now know, the same thing as contribution margin per unit, dollars and sixty. Remember that from a moment ago. So that's how it is done. Sometimes you also see it expressed this way as contribution margin ratio. So it's not a uh, 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 a dollar amount or a number of units we're solving for here, but we're solving for a percent. Basically, this ratio, which is calculated by taking contribution margin and dividing it by total revenue, so the $20,000 contribution margin uh, divided by total revenue uh, gives me my answer of 80 percent here. So um, that means that out of every dollar of sales, every dollar of sales, 80 percent goes to covering fixed costs and goes to profit. That's a very profitable thing we're doing here. Okay, and then I 
give you a little bit more down here, and we'll see this in a moment in a polling question. Uh, this takes us beyond the exam here, this last, these last lines. But I think this, if you understand this, you really understand this topic uh, very well. Let's say we want to target net income. In other words, we're not interested right now in just knowing what our break-even point is, but we want to know how much money are we going to make if we, uh, uh, how many units are we going to have to produce if we want to make X dollars. So it's a slightly different way to pose the problem. Using the formula here, we need to notice here, we need to, to our fixed costs, we also need to add profit uh, uh, in our calculation of uh, our quote-unquote new break-even point. It's, a, it's not in this sense a break-even point anymore. It's, it's a, the number of units at which we make the desired profit. So the desired profit of 5,000 in the calculation works just as it would, as, as fixed costs would. You have to add them to fixed costs. You get a bigger denominator, this a numerator this way. You uh, divide by the same contribution margin per unit, and you see that my um, my the place or the the productivity at which I make um, a profit of. Um, uh, $5,000 is going to be considerably higher than my break-even. Break-even was at 12500 Now I need to be looking at 15625 units in order to make that $5,000. Okay, so that said, we're ready for a polling question. And Martha, take us away and show us polling question number one. Okay, when we get finished with this, we've got a couple of questions we need to back up to as well. Um, contribution okay. margin uh, decreases. <clears throat> contribution margin um, decreases when sales volume remains the same and fixed cost increases, fixed cost decreases, variable cost per unit increases, or variable cost per unit decreases. And remember, if you would like your continuing education credits, you must participate in the polling questions. We have uh, several questions coming, or answers coming in. Leave it open for just a few more seconds. Um, And we've got about 85% who have voted. So I'm going to close and share the results. The results indicated that 52% uh, said variable cost per unit increases. That is the right answer. So thank you very much for your answers. But what I owe you is an explanation of why that is the right answer for those of you who answered uh, differently. First of all, uh, remember what contribution margin is. Contribution margin is the difference between revenue and variable cost. So if that's what contribution margin is, if that's the definition of it, then uh, it can't, then the answer can't be A or B. It can't have any, it, the, the, the definition of a contribution margin doesn't have the word fixed cost in it. So it can't have anything to do with A or B. So it can only be C or D. And then if you think about it, that my contribution margin I'm, is going to be lower. I'm going to make less money. My revenue minus variable cost is going to be less if my variable cost increases. So C is the right answer. Martha, let's do the next question. Question number two, please. Okay. Contribution margin ratio always increases when the break even point increases, break even point decreases, variable cost as a percentage of net sales decrease, 
variable cost as a percentage of net sales increase. And we will leave that open for a few minutes. There's um, about 20% have voted. Okay, we're getting to about 80% have voted with um, a particular majority having answered um, that the contribution margin ratio always increases when the C variable cost as a percentage of net sales decrease. That was 59% of the answer. Martha, thank you very much. And audience, thank you very much. That is indeed the right answer. Sir, uh, let me explain to you why that is. Um, it can't be A or B. Why? Because the contribution margin, by definition, remember back to the definition, is revenue minus variable cost. So, just like up above here, that where two of the answers involve fixed costs, here two of the answers involve break even point. So, that really is uh, not germane to uh, the calculation or the interpretation of contribution margin. So the contribution margin, or in this case, contribution margin ratio, which is simply contribution margin expressed as a percentage, it increases when variable costs as a percentage of sales decrease. Okay, the if my costs go down as a percent of sales, my contribution margin as a percent of sales is going to increase. It's going to be more profitable. So C is the right answer here. And Martha, you said you had a couple of questions. Uh, yes, there's a couple of questions that relate to contribution margin, and then um, we can save the other ones. They related back to the variance analysis or when you get to a good point there. One of them on the... Um, uh, contribution um, margin break-even analysis. Uh, Justin said, is there a standard model template with graph capability available we can use for the break-even analysis? Wow, that's a wonderful question. No, there isn't. Um, there is not a template. Y you know what? Actually, there is. Yes, and I'm going to send you the template making myself a note here. Um, and we're going to get to that template in just a moment. Uh, the graph itself that I showed you, I just made up. Uh, and uh, you, I, I'm not familiar with a tool that would graph it for you, but uh, I can certainly send you a template for doing the calculation. Uh, let's do the next polling question because we're still on this topic of cost volume profit and then we'll come back to the questions on variance analysis. Well there was there was one more on contribution margin ratio. Okay. Uh, it says the contribution margin ratio says contribution margin divided by total revenue but the example is using fixed cost. Yes. Uh, and why is that the, the 20,000, uh, the, that happens to be the same number. I, I think I see what you're talking about. Let me go there and uh, see if I can answer that question. That's a, a, a valid point. I think we're right here. I almost stumbled over this myself because this $20,000 here, this number, I can't quite get myself to highlight it. This one right here, labeled as contribution margin, happens to be the same as my fixed costs here. But uh, what it actually is, I'm going to reach for my calculator and see if what I'm saying makes any sense. This $20,000 is my contribution margin per unit, cost, which is 160 times my uh, break-even point 
20,000. So what it is, is this, uh, it's, uh, da, 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 this number here, 1.6 times this number. And I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from asking this question. And I need to uh, somehow fix this so it's clear what I'm doing. So in other words, this $20,000 is not this number. What it is, is this number times this number. So I have some work to do to uh, explain this a little bit better. So thank you for that question. Uh, and um, what should we do? I think we should do the next problem, which has the template in it. And I think will help help you understand the question. But before, uh, Martha, before you open the uh, polling, uh, we're using a question here that requires some calculations. And you're going to cover up the screen when you display the polling question. So we're going to have to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to show you the template. I'm going to show you the problem. You do the calculation. And then after a little while, uh, Martha will display the question. And then you can answer it and, and, and make your choice. So bear with me as we try this. And we have I have not tried this before. So first of all, what is the question? The question is stated here is that HFMA Haas, well, OK, I'll show it to you first. Here's the question. Here it is. OK. Um, HFMA Hospital is considering opening a second DME store. So it already operates one, wants to add another store where they sell wheelchairs and walkers and so forth. And uh, your job is to estimate the annual break even in number of uh, sales and in dollars. Here are your choices, A, B, C, and D. This is what you're going to see when Martha displays the question. But uh, uh, the software that we use for the webinars, this go-to software, is very limited in how much information you can display on a polling question. So we're going to have to, uh, uh, I'm going to have to show you the information um, in more detail or tell you where it is in the book so that you can do the calculation. Turn please to page 272. I'm going to go there myself. OK, here's the information that you need to answer this question. And the question is here on the top of the next page. So giving you more information this time around. Uh, they operate one durable medical equipment store and want to start another one. The average sale at the first store, and that's going to be the same at the new store, is $500 per sale. Here are my variable costs. They happen to consist of two different things, my uh, the, the product and then the setup fee. Here are my annual fixed expenses. I have rent, wages, utilities and other to the tune of $36,000. So the polling question uh, asks to answer this one right here. What is my annual break-even point in dollar sales and the number of units sold? Then when we get to the answer, I'm going to also show you how to do the other calculations. But uh, that's not what you're asked to do. You're asked to calculate the break-even point in dollar sales and number of sales. So take a moment to do that, uh, say a minute. And then I will ask Martha to display the question so you can answer it.
Okay, in answering this, remember what the definition of contribution margin is. It is revenue minus variable cost. So here's revenue, here's variable cost. So my contribution margin is this number minus this number, okay? You do the math. Remember that my break-even point, I'm just going to give you the formula, is fixed costs, this number, divided by contribution margin. Okay, I've basically given you the answer already here by the way I explained it. So, uh, Martha, open the polling question, please, so participants can answer. Okay, the um, answer A is the break even, um, annual break even in dollars and numbers would be $50,000 and 100 units, B, 60,000 and 120 units, C, 70,000, 140 units, or D, 80,000 and 160 units. And we have overwhelming majority with the answer. Very good. Um, we have, I'll let, get everybody a chance to vote. We're about at 75% voted, so. I think we've got the answer, so I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. And the overwhelming majority was the answer was 50,100 units. Exactly. Thank you, Martha, and thank you all for participating and answering the question. Let's go into our template here. This is our template. And uh, remember, there were four different things that the problem overall the case study asked us to calculate. We only did the first one of them, and this break even one in our calculation. So here's the information again. You've already seen it. But watch me as I put this in. My sale is uh, $500, $500 per sale. My uh, uh, variable cost is $1, $140. Okay. So my contribution margin is 360. My contribution margin percentage is uh, the uh, contribution margin divided by uh, my uh, sale of a f uh, 500 for contribution margin percentage of 72%. That what wasn't asked, but uh, might as well just calculate it while we're at it. So let's see what our break even is. Our break even is fixed costs remember goes in the numerator and uh, our contribution margin uh, goes in the denominator okay a hundred items we need to sell uh, at 500 uh, per uh, item that's fifty thousand dollars and uh, contribution margin percent of 72 percent now let's do these other calculations because they're kind of interesting now, if we wanted to look at the other break-evens, actually, I'm just going to, rather than put the numbers in, I'll show you the answer. You don't need to watch me pound numbers into Excel here. So under break-even two, under break-even two, we are assuming that we can lower the installation costs from $40 in the example to $20, reduce them by half. So what does that do if a, a portion of my variable cost goes down uh, and, and my variable cost up here is only $120, then my contribution margin is now $380. That lowers, if I put that into the calculation here, that lowers my break-even point to 95 units uh, my sales at break even are going to be uh, 47,368. My contribution margin percent has increased as we would expect it to. So that's what we're doing 
here in calculating break-even two, assuming that we can lower our setup costs, in-home setup costs. Now under break-even three, we are assuming that we are going to have to spend $7,200 to advertise our new location. So that is a new fixed expense in a way, one that we hadn't anticipated or built into our original model. So it's 36,000 plus 7,200 is 43,200. So, so my numerator is higher. Notice that my break even point uh, uh, is going to be higher. It's going to be 120 units, assuming uh, uh, that everything stays equal, I now have to sell $60,000 worth of equipment and uh, here's my contribution margin percent again. Now in the last example we are saying we want to make $18,000 of profit. This is similar to the example I explained from the study guide uh, uh, up front. So my, uh, again, this basically uh, adds cost and I add them to my fixed expenses and uh, 36,000 plus the 18,000 is 54,000. My contribution margin hasn't changed. It still is a hundred and uh, three hundred and sixty dollars. So my break even point here is 150 items. So I need to sell that many items to be making an $18,000 profit. Total sales in that case would be 75,000 for contribution margin ratio still of 72%. So hopefully that all helps um, you understand this important topic. Now, Martha, you mentioned there was a question relating to variances. Let's do that right now. Yes, there was a, a couple other questions that have come in, and I guess one of them on that template that you were just showing, is that the one you were yes. going to be sending out? That's not yes, in the book, it is. right? Okay. It's not in the book. No, I will send you out this template so you can do okay. the exercise yourself. Um, on the... Um, Let's see. Let's, while we're still there, there's one question that came in on that one on the uh, 47,000. The 47,368 is the 500 yes. times the $94. 95. Yes. Uh, not 500 times 95 units. Oh. How is, how, how is handling, uh, how to handle rounding? So. Oh yes, yes. I'm I'm doing some rounding here. Yes. Okay. This is re really not 95. It's like 94 and something or another. So I I fudged. Thank you for yeah. catching that. My goodness, somebody is really paying attention. Yes, I fudged <laughs> this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't want to say 94 point something units. So yeah, this gives you a precision that there really isn't here. Very good okay. point. Okay. Um, the other one other question was there seems to be a lot of of. Uh, the practice test and the online training didn't really get into variance analysis this much. Is there really this much questions related to variance analysis on the exam? Uh, yes. I believe you had said yeah, there was on that Yes, one. the answer is the clearly yes. And uh, I told you, I think I told you last week that I was myself surprised uh, that by looking at the online study guide, I, I didn't really feel as ready as I should have been. I passed, I kind of bruised my ego a little bit that I didn't uh, do as well as I thought. And one of the topics that was uh, on the exam were, were um, there were nearly as, I, I'm gonna have to be careful, there were maybe, uh, I'm kind of thinking there were three sets of questions on ratio analysis and a set of questions is uh, like five questions uh, on a data set. So there were three, two or three data sets relating to uh, ratios. There were, I believe, two on variance analysis. So it, it's heavily tested. Okay. That's why we're spending time on this. Okay. The other question related back to the um, 
uh, variable or the labor variances that we calculated. Okay. And I think you were showing them the rates per hour to four decimal places. <laughs> yes. Does that have to be four decimal places? Is there a rule of thumb? Can it be two decimal places? All good I'm, question. I'm sure it's yeah. just rounding. Yes, it is rounding. And uh, what I'm doing there, and I, I could go back there if I can remember what page number this is. Uh, I'm going to go, it's on page 360. Here we go. I'm using an actual um, statement, uh, operating statement to do these calculations. And the math doesn't work out unless you take it out to that kind of a precision. If I didn't, you see differences due to decimal truncation, I tell you this here. I wouldn't, uh, I'd be close, but I wouldn't be as close to the variance I'm trying to explain. So in order to get to as close as I can, I'm taking it out to four decimals here. You would not have to do that on the exam. This is just to make an actual example work for you in, as an illustration in this class. Good question. Anything okay. else on variances? Uh, I think, let's see. I think that's pretty much um, it. Most of it relates to rounding and the the questions on, on that. So I think we're good. Okay. Oh, thank you, Martha. Then let's do the next polling question because there is I do have uh, polling question number four here, which is a uh, is a uh, okay. Let's. I want to make sure I'm not misleading you. Let's look at the next polling question. I've got it. The project being planned will cost thirty thousand dollars. Is that the one? Uh, it it actually isn't. No, no. Okay. So don't show this one yet. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show it to you here. This is something that I've since added, okay, since I sent Martha the polling questions. Look at this question number four. This is not a polling question. This is a question that is new and that were, that you won't be able to answer. Please take a look at this and then um, Martha, can you look at the, a show of hands if I ask the audience to vote with their hands, would you be able to kind of gauge how they answer this question? I can probably look at it if we, um, um, a show of hands if it's A, B, or C, or yes. whichever, uh, I can try to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> We'll just see what we can do here. This is I. Uh, this is something I just developed. This is brand new, and that's why it's not in your in your book in in the polling questions. Okay. the The question. Um, I guess if we can answer it, the if the, is the answer yes. Um, a, we can get. Um, Let's see a show of hands, hands for A. For A. Okay. You don't have to count them; just kind of give a a general feel for for it. And and everybody who answered A, take your hands down, and uh, everybody who answered B, now raise their hand. Martha, take a look at what, what you see under B, under how many hands you see up there right now. And then take your hands down, everyone, and those of you who think C is the right answer, raise your hand, please. Okay, Martha, what, uh, what, what do what's the audience saying? I think it was C. Yes, C is okay. the right answer. 
<laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Martha, for kind of winging it on this one. Okay, uh, take a screenshot, do a screen print of this if you'd like uh, to uh, keep this question for uh, your study. So the right answer is C. Yes. All right, we are ready to go into capital budgeting, which is our last topic. And uh, I just uh, tell you, after doing ratios last week and doing all of this quantitative stuff uh, this week, you are going to find the next uh, couple webinars, I think, uh, easier because there's not going to be as much uh, number crunching on them. Okay, so we are now on topic number three. Oh, by the way, just in case, you know, I'm I always try to relate what we're doing here to the real world uh, so this doesn't seem so dry and so theoretical. And uh, so I want to point you to a brief discussion in the book relating to uh, cost, volume, profit on page 48. Go to page 48 please, right here. I was asked, I think it might have been a year ago at the Region 5 webinars, at these very webinars, someone asked, well, this is all fine and good, all of this stuff with these graphs, you know, here are these graphs, uh, but what does this all mean to us in healthcare? Well, uh, uh, I wondered myself how I might relate uh, this cost, volume, profit stuff to uh, our current conversation in healthcare where we're drive, trying to drive costs out of our system. And so I, I found, luckily, an article here from last January, January 2013, by David Young, Fiscal Strategy of an Era of Reform. What I've done here on this page is uh, abstract this article and uh, uh, because it shows the relevance of this, converse, this uh, whole topic for uh, our healthcare, and I also want to add that this article won the best article of the year award in the magazine last year. So it's a real gem, and, and uh, it can help us understand how this stuff is relevant. So with that said, we're going to go into capital projects now. So what are we doing here? We're looking for return on investment. Now, return on investment, I did a search on the uh, words ROI, the initials, the letters ROI, in several years worth of HFMA articles. How did I do that? Well, I'll give you a, a, a little secret. Uh, I scanned the magazine uh, into, into my computer and then I convert it to text, I make it text readable. And uh, that allows me to find things in the magazine that I, I may be interested to learn something more about, in part to prepare the materials for these webinars. And I found lots and lots of hits on ROI. And as I followed each one of them, in only one case did the author of the article define his or her calculation for ROI and give evidence of how the, the math worked. So there's a lot of claims out there about ROI. It's kind of the favorite initials of, of many of us. But unless by ROI we mean one of these three things, namely net present value, internal rate or return, or payback period, if it's not one of these three, beware. It's got to be one of these three to be ROI, return on investment, when it comes to spending money on a capital project. Uh, so we're going to have to talk about these three methods, and this is also on the exam, and uh, thus worthy of our intention. So what's the first one of these? The first one is uh, net present value method. Let's talk about what it is. You will be familiar from your finance class or your accounting 101 class with the concept of present value. It's also called the time value of money and it, it's a way to uh, compare uh, future uh, amounts to present amounts given that uh, uh, money has a time value 
or time has a, I should say it the other way around, that time has a monetary value and an ice cream cone for which I'm willing to pay a dollar today, I won't be willing to pay a dollar for today if I have to wait a year to eat that ice cream cone, I will only be willing to give you less for it, if anything at all. So the present value technique is one that makes us able to compare apples to apples when it comes to how much something costs us today and what the benefits are going to be that we derive from that expenditure today. So that's what present value is. It's a kind of a, uh, it's related to the concept of interest or interest rate, except it works the other way around. And the interest rate works forward, uh, you know, a uh, dollar plus 10% interest is a dollar 10. Uh, the other way around is how you use a present value table. So a dollar ten times this present value factor here at ten percent of point nine oh nine oh nine gives you a dollar. So it works. It's just the other way. It works the other way around. So well, how do we use this uh, time value of money technique or concept in capital budgeting? And that's where this letter. N comes in. The N, it's not just the present value technique, it's a net present value technique. So we're netting something, we're calculating something, and what we're doing is we are uh, comparing the present value of the future cash flows to the money we're spending today. And that's what the N in the, in the uh, concept means. It's the one minus the other. How much are we deriving from it, uh, expressed in today's dollars, less what we're spending today in today's dollars to build build this thing. So what do we need to do, uh, what does it require to do this? We need, to dis we need a discount rate, we need something, an interest rate, so to speak, that we uh, employ in this calculation. So in the real world, what is this discount rate? It's typically the av weighted average cost of capital, uh, WACC WAC, I guess is how it's pronounced and abbreviated. It's the weighted average cost of capital. What that means is how much does it cost me, my organization, to borrow money or finance something through debt. Uh, now in our to present day interest rate environment, that that rate is very low. So that's why uh, the, the Fed has kept interest rates low to encourage investment and, and encourage consumption. Uh, in the capital budgeting, you're not necessarily going to use a low uh, uh, discount rate like that or interest rate because uh, you also need to build into your uh, calculus the the risk that a project might pose. Uh, it may not necessarily generate the kind of income or profitability or profit that you are hoping for, so you're going to have to raise the hurdle a little bit and use a higher discount rate uh, before you will approve something. So it could, there could be other factors influencing what the discount rate is other than the weighted average cost of capital. So what it really is in that sense is a minimal acceptable rate of return. Look at the table of how this works. Uh, the table here shows you that one period out, a dollar a year from now in, expressed in today is 91 cents, a dollar two years out in, expressed in today's equivalent is 83 cents and, and you see how it diminishes over time. Now before we look at an example in the text of how this works, let me also say that we don't necessarily have the luxury of evaluating all capital projects by any of these methodologies, be it this one or the internal rate of return method or the uh, payback period method. Be, why? Because some things we have to do whether we want to do them or not. If you are a hospital in, if you have a hospital in California and uh, it got shaken up in the earthquake in 1989, the Loma Linda earthquake, 
which brought down a part of the Oakland Bridge, if you remember, uh, you're going to have to perform seismic upgrades, whether they make money for you or not. Uh, same with federal mandates for, under HIPAA for s security and privacy. Certain investments or RAC investments uh, in, in terms of audit tools, they're not going to return any money to you. They're just things that you uh, just have to do. So we don't always have the luxury to evaluate things uh, in a strictly economic way. Let's look at an example of uh, this uh, net present value method at work. Turn please to page 50. Ah, here we go. Page 50. Make this a little bit bigger for you. All right, here, here are the facts of the case. Uh, the hospital gift shop manager <coughs> would like to remodel the gift shop. Uh, he thinks or she thinks that uh, the decor is a little out of date. It kind of looks like 80s, purple and mauve and so forth. It's time for an update for uh, refreshing. And uh, it's going to cost $365,000 to do that. And uh, the uh, manager predicts that we're going to sell $100,000 more balloons and uh, lotions and greeting cards and teddy bears as a result. Cost of capital or the hurdle rate for this project, 10%. Is this a go or a no go? Okay, uh, is this uh, going to pay off or not? Here's the present value table you've just seen on the PowerPoint slides, and, and below that is how you use that table to calculate the, the uh, net present value. So the $100,000 cash, extra cash, in year one times that discount factor here multiplies out, and you do that five times over, uh, add it all together, come up with $379,000 and some change. That's more than the initial cost of $365,000. In other words, this is, a, this is something worth doing. It's going to pay back $14,079. All right, so that's a goal. Let's look at a second example. In this case, we're looking at a choice we're looking at uh, either purchasing a, an MRI machine for, let's say, a million dollars or a CT scanner for 600000 What are the cash flows? Again, 10% is the cost of capital. Annual cash flows in the MRI, 300000 200000 for the CT. You know, these are pretty made up numbers, you can tell. Uh, but for purposes of an example, they're good enough. You add up the, you do the present value calculation on both pieces of equipment. You get two different amounts. You subtract from them the outlay of 100 million here, 600,000 here. You get the net present value. That's the N in the calculation. And you see that the CT scanner has a higher net present value than the more expensive. Uh, uh, MRI machine. So what would you do? You would buy the CT scanner. Maybe you'd buy both, but if you can't, you're, you're going to buy the CT scanner first and maybe the MRI machine later. So that's how the um, uh, net present value method works. And uh, we have a question on this. And um, Martha, this is polling question number it's polling question number five. I wonder if you can skip number four right now and go to polling question number five. That would be the project has a cash outflow of $33,000? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martha is going to bring up that question, but you're going to have to need your book uh, to for more information than uh, the system allows Martha to pre project on your screen. So please uh, turn to page 274 for that extra piece of information. And Martha, I'm just going to do that.
before you actually show the okay. questions so people can at least see it and then you can display your information right on top of it. So here's the question in its uh, full glory. A project will cost $22,000. Annual cash flow will be $5,000 a year for seven years. Uh, using a rate of return of 12%, what is the present value of the cash flows generated by the project and the net present value of the project overall? And then I'm telling you that you need to use a present value of an annuity factor of 4.5638. Let me explain to you, first of all, what this is, this annuity table and this particular factor. So, so rather than uh, using uh, a, a more complicated present value table that we looked at a moment ago, and doing the calculation for year one, for year two, for year three, and so forth, we can use a annuity table which gives us uh, under the uh, seven year on the row seven uh, for under the column for twelve percent a combined present value factor that adds up all of the present value factors for each of the seven years together. So use this single number in your calculation, 4.5638. So you have this information on page 274. So Martha, please show polling question number five so you can answer it. I don't think polling question five relates to net present value. It oh, relates, which it's, is? It's, um, that one says a project has a capital outlay of $33,000 and annual cash inflow of 10000 Oh, You're then it's the one IR. before that. A project the plan uh, project plan will cost $30,000. What is the payback period for the project? No, there should be one that's, that says a $22,000 project will generate 5000 a year for seven years. No, I don't have that one. Oh, you don't have that. Uh-uh. No. Okay. Well, I can't show you then what that one is. Well, um, okay, my some, bad. I'm getting some questions back that says, is the answer seven? Or is this number seven? Or number seven is the question that we're talking about that's on, that you're showing on your screen. Yes, it's question number seven, but the polling question, you should have it as a polling question. You should have it as one of the polling questions. Should I think be polling question number five? Uh, Do you have a polling question number five that says twenty-two thousand no, dollar project? I don't have anything that's got twenty-two thousand. Okay, then we're going to have to skip this. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, you can look up the answer in the back of the book. The answer is well. I'll just let you do the math. Well, we won't spend any time on it and move right on. Sorry about that. Okay, that's the net present value method explained, I hope, adequately. Christoph, Let's... I did have a, a couple questions on net present sure. value. Um, okay. Is the net pre or is the present value tables always the same? You're going to be given the present value table in the on the exam. Okay. So you don't need to use a financial calculator that tells you what a present value of something is. There's going to be a little table uh, given and uh, so it's going to be easy for you to do the calculation. You just simply have to pick the right number off the table. And I think as we were talking about capital projects, somebody said, is there anything to do with the cost of capital in the computation? Um, no, that's going to be given to you. Okay. It's going to say the cost of capital is X and then the table will have the present value uh, uh, ratios for that particular cost of capital. Okay. Uh, I think that's all that I had on those questions. Okay, Martha, thank you. And thank you for audience for asking, asking questions about this. Okay, let's move on then to the in, in, internal rate of return, abbreviated IRR. This can be uh, daunting or seem daunting. It's actually, it may seem harder than it actually is. I think once you understand what it is, you will actually like this and prefer it over the net present value method. 
what are we doing in the eternal rate of return uh, form of analyzing uh, a capital project. Basically what we're doing is we're saying, we're asking ourselves what rate of return will a project given certain assumptions actually earn us. So we're not solving for dollar amount, we're solving for a percentage, a rate of return, a profitability percentage of a project. We employ the present value technique in doing this and uh, in order to do the calculation what we do is something that is explained in this sentence here that I highlighted. IRR is the interest rate that equates the present value of a project's cash inflows with the cost of the project. It's the interest rate at which the discounted cash inflows and the outflows or today's outlay exactly cancel each other out. So it is essentially the the uh, in the the cash the present value of the uh, the earnings as uh, minus the outlay today equals zero equals zero. So rather, and, and then solving for the uh, interest rate that accomplishes that, that, in, that uh, exactly makes the inflows equal the, the known outflow today. Uh, using uh, the same gift shop remodel example. Remember $365,000 is the cost of it. For five years, it's going to return $100,000 in, in extra sales, so we hope and expect. So using the, looking now at a, a, a table similar to the one that, uh, an annuity table similar to the one with this question that we weren't able to answer because I didn't have it set up as a polling question. Uh, what is, what uh, is the interest rate next to that annuity table value that, that uh, allows us to equate the outlays with the inflows of cash in the future. So here is the factor, uh, you just have to take a stab at it at the table and say well okay let's try 11% and see what happens. So the annuity value on the table uh, I don't know if monks uh, in, in monasteries calculated this years ago and, 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 and bequeathed this on humanity. I don't know who calculated these values originally by hand. Uh, at 11 percent, this, this is the annuity uh, present value factor to use. So at $100,000 a year, this calculation is easy. So for five years, uh, 100000 uh, present value back to, to today's worth at an 11 percent rate is 369,590. It's this present value factor times the annual cash flow. If I go one step higher and look at the uh, table for 12 percent and use this uh, annuity factor here which is going to be lower because my hurdle rate is higher, the higher my discount rate is. I come up with this value here, multiplies out to $360,048. Now notice that my cost of $365,000 is somewhere in, the, in between these two numbers there on the right. It's kind of halfway if, if you wanted to kind of ballpark it. And uh, the question then is exactly where is it? Uh, and it turns out to be at 11.48 percent, so almost at the halfway mark. How did that, how did I come up with that when I just say that here? You can see the calculation in the book uh, up front. Where am I? I'm on page 54, 52, I'm on page 52. Okay, let me go there and show it to you. 
okay, here's my gift shop remote, the same example, the, what we just looked at on the PowerPoint. Here it is again. Uh, you're familiar with all of this. This you've already seen. And then down below here is the interpolation. This is how you exactly figure out that it is 11.48%, which is what I just told you. You don't need to know this on the exam. You don't need to interpolate an exact interest rate or rate of return. Again, I'm showing this to you because hopefully this makes it more useful than something you study for on an exam. If you know that there is a way to uh, uh, hone in and uh, uh, fix the actual interest rate or rate of return, it's good to know that and you can do this in, in a calculation yourself. So at 11.48% of an internal rate of return, the 365,000 outlay today would exactly generate 100,000 a year for five years. That's how this works. Now, we should have a question on this in the polling questions. And it's the question, I think you mentioned it a moment ago, Martha. It's the question that starts with a project offering an initial cash outflow of 33,000. Yes, I have that one. Okay, before you show that, okay. I'm going to tell you where to go and find that in the book. Again, we're doing this because the go-to webinar doesn't allow us to display enough information. So it happens to be question number eight here on the screen. Ignore the fact that it's called number eight here and in the polling question it has a different number. So here's the question. So I'm going to help you answer this one uh, uh, to make it easy. Okay, first of all, the, the, the fact that the question uses round numbers like this makes it easy in the first place. So we uh, are going to spend $33,000. We expect to get 10000 for five years. And we want to know what that is. What is the rate of return? Uh, the, um, I'm going to just walk you through it and then you can answer it. If you do the math, Okay, you take this factor at 12%, 3.6048, you multiply that by 10,000 for five years, you get uh, uh, $36,000. So that's, that's an interest rate or discovery that's too low because this number is, uh, is too high. Okay, it's higher than this 33,000. At the next uh, discount rate, at 13%, I'm getting closer. I'm now at 35,172. If I multiply this factor by 10,000, at 14%, I'm getting closer yet. I'm at 34,000. Keep going. At 15%, I'm at 33,000. Again, multiplying by 10,000. And at 16%, now I am actually under my value. So this tells me that the answer has to be somewhere between 15 and 16 percent. So Martha, show us uh, quest the, this the polling question, please, on the screen. The answer has to be between 15 and 16 percent. Okay, the uh, project has a cash outflow of $33,000, an annual cash inflow of 10000 for five years, and no salvage value compute the internal rate of return, 14.35, 14.65, 15.67, or none of the above. Thank you, Martha. And we have um, an overwhelming majority for the answer, uh, but I will leave it open so that folks can continue to vote for just a minute regarding their getting their CPE um, credits on this. And we are basically there, so I'm going to close this, share the results, and it's an overwhelming majority of 15.67% that 
89% answered that and we had a few others answer the other ways. All right, Martha, thank you and thank you audience. Yes, that's the right answer. And you see how the multiple choice helps you here even if you don't uh, do the math. Yes, it's uh, 15 point uh, two thirds percent. All right, we are ready to do the last of the methods here, the payback method. This is the, the favorite of the three uh, by people who just want a quick and dirty answer without uh, worrying about uh, present value of one or present value of annuity tables. So what we're looking at here is how long will it take for the initial outlay to be earned uh, again by uh, and pay and the project pay for itself project pay for itself as it is sometimes uh, referred to. So you're basically looking at how many months or years is it going to take for me to recover everything I spent today. It's a quick and dirty way of doing it. It's very popular, but it has, while it gives you an answer that's consistent with the other two methods, it nevertheless has a couple of flaws in, in case you're interested. It ignores the time value of money. All right, and second of all, it also ignores what is the project going to uh, return after it's paid for itself. So I'm, I'm only looking as far as the tip of my nose, how long will it take to pay itself back, pay for itself and not any further. So there is an example of that in your book. And we're gonna look at that. So, and then do a poly question on it as well. I have to find it first. Payback. Yes, on page fifty three. Here we go. All right. Ah, we're still on our uh, gift shop remodel here. <coughs> Initial cost, you know what it is, 365 for the gift shop. You also remember the other numbers. And so here's the math, okay? So the initial cost times the annual payback. So for the gift shop, it's 3.65 years. MRI, 3.3 years. CT, three years. Now notice that uh, the answer, the more exact answer, would have been to purchase, remember, purchase the CT scanner rather than the MRI machine. Uh, when you do the back of the envelope uh, payback method, you, it reverses. So you see that this method has, has some flaws, but uh, they're not major flaws. So there's a polling question related to this. And I am now so unsure of the numbering of them, but it should say a project being planned will cost $30,000. That is the question. And hopefully, Martha, you can show the audience that question. Yes, so I have that one. We'll launch that one. A project being planned will cost $30,000. What is the payback period for the project? 3.24 years. 3.4 years, 3.43 years, or none of the above. Okay, now, when you look at that, you're gonna say, there's no way I can calculate that, and you are right, because again, we are missing information that um, we need to do this. So, turn please to page, excuse me, I need to clear my throat. Turn please to page 274. That will allow you to answer this polling question. It's question number six on page 274. Okay, we've got a very small percentage that's voted on this one yeah. at this point in time. So I'm going to leave it open for a few more minutes for yes. 
Yeah, now we're beginning to have the votes come in. Okay, super. We've got about 40% uh, that's voted. This is tough because I'm not making it easy for you by giving you multiple choices that are all in the three plus year time frame. I'm just going to give you a hint. It's not none of the above, okay? Okay, we've got about 65% of the vote group, so let me leave it open for a little bit longer so people can calculate away. Yes. Okay, we're getting there. We've got about 75% that's voted. I'm going to leave it open for about 10 more seconds. Because we're running close on time. Okay, I will close and share. 45% uh, said the payback period would be 3.43 years. 30% said 3.4 years. 8% said 3.24 years. And the rest said none of the above. Christoph, have we lost your um, sound? Yes, sorry okay. about that. That's I was okay. clearing my throat and didn't turn my sound back on. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. So on the left you have the data, on the right you have the solution. Here's the solution. So we know that after year one we haven't paid it for it yet, year two we haven't, year three we're at uh, what 24,000 adding up these three numbers. So it's longer than three years but it's less long than four years because at the end of four years we will have add, we will have another 14,000 of cash flow. So the question is what exactly is the interval between year three and four that gives us uh, uh, our payback period. And you see the calculation here at left, $24,000 is what I have after year three. And then if I take uh, uh, what it is I need, I need uh, uh, $6,000 more uh, to have paid back for it, 30,000 is my total um, expenditure, 24 is what I have so far, so 6,000 out of 14, which is the interval, which is uh, the next hurdle, the next uh, tier is uh, 0.43. So I add that to 3 and it's 3.43 years. That's how the payback method works. Have we done enough polling questions to satisfy the uh, uh, CPE folks? How many have we done? One, two, three, four, five. We've have we done five? We've completed five. And how many do we need to do? Let's do one more. Yeah. Let's do one more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm sorry that we're out of time here. That's where I had meant to do this one question that uh, you don't seem to have, but we luckily we have one more to do. Okay, and so I'm going to show it to you. 
here it is, and uh, I'll show you where it is in the book. Okay, the page uh, in the book that you need to go to is uh, page 274. Let me show that to you. 274. Kind of slow scrolling here. Here we go. It's at the bottom of this page. Here's the data. Hopefully you can see this. I'm going to have to help you, given that this is not an easy problem. Okay, so we are looking here hey, Christoph, at... Uh, yes, go ahead. Let's just do this while you're kind of talking about it. I'm going to go ahead and sh um, put that polling question up. Yes. This is really the point of the polling questions, primarily from a CPE, is just to make sure people are actually in attendance. Um, okay. So I'm just going to throw up and everybody just plug in whatever answer you want and hit submit, because that's all I need from a CPE perspective, and then you can go ahead and talk about it while they're doing that, but this will at least Perfect. give everybody a chance before they've yes. got to go to their next meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, and I apologize for going over. Brad, that's a good idea. So just answer the question, and then I will keep talking uh, for those of you who, who care about the right answer here. So we have eight projects. Oh, that's not right. Yeah, eight projects labeled A to G, uh, that we can spread our money amongst. We only have $50,000 to spend and uh, our hurdle rate is 12%. So what uh, projects would you fund? You have a bunch of choices here. Uh, so you have to, in order to do this, uh, first of all, determine which combination of projects uh, allow you to spend all of your $50,000. Then you need to calculate the uh, present value for, or the net present value for each of those projects, and then add up uh, the three that give you the highest net present value. Okay, so that's the the pro. Uh, the, the, how the solution works, and it so turns out that you can do projects A, D, and E, and um, I don't know if you can see the answer right now, uh, I'm not sure, or if you're still looking at the, looking at the, uh, the polling question on your screens, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, we, we, I've still got the polling question up. I've got a couple people still answering, so okay. um, I'll leave it up for about another 15 seconds. So if we are at about 80% voted. So if you are still here, please go ahead and vote quickly. Yes. Let me just tell you what the right answer is so make it easy. Yeah, the right answer is D. So if you haven't clicked on anything, click on D. And then if you want to stay around another couple minutes, I'll show you the answer once uh, Brad closes the poll. And you don't have to tell us what the result is. Oh, I mean, it's, I can tell you what the result is because that's the best part. The, the, okay, the, then do. Go the, for the, it, Brad. The result was um, the second choice because it started with C. And everybody always picks C when in doubt. Oh, okay. All right. Well, the right answer is D. The right answer is D. Uh, and why is that? Uh, those of you who are still on the call, notice that I have 50000 to spend. Projects A, D, and E give me 50000 The present value, net present value that I calculated here and uh, uh, marked in yellow for those three projects are... Uh, uh, you know, 900 plus 1200 plus another 900. That is more than I would get out of the combination of any other uh, projects uh, that total $50,000. So this is the best I can do uh, amongst my choices. My eight choices is to pick projects A, D, and E, for number one, because I can afford them, and number two, because they're going to give me the highest return. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you all. Uh, I wish you a good weekend, a good uh, St. Patrick's Day on Monday. Look forward to uh, resuming our conversation next Thursday on the Revenue Cycle. Great. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, so we will see you guys again next week. Uh, look for the recording of this webinar to go up on YouTube probably sometime uh, 
late this afternoon or early evening. And, and the uh, template as well that I'm going to send to Brad. Yep. So once you send that to me, I'll get that posted on the website as well. And so that website is tnhfma.org slash chfp hyphen webinars. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. The organizer.